I want to give you like a visual kind of description of what effect they have. So as a mortgage broker, if clients, customers ask you about rates and the effect, etc., you, you can be a little bit more knowledgeable how you describe stuff to them. Um, but of course, in the meantime, the FCA have been up to their uh, their good again. They've um, the new guy came in last year, and uh, he's been shaking things up, which is a new broom and all that stuff. And he's brought in this new um, AR regime, not not the consumer duty. Push that one aside. It's the AR regime or the appointed representative regime, because his view and the FCA's view is that appointed representatives are not been. Uh, looked after by their principal firms, because probably they're not. I'm not going to say they're not, but I've, I've heard some horror stories. I really have. Now, the point I'm going to make here is that um, there's lots of things coming in. They've got like, to the end of the year to make things happen. There's got to be more oversight, more information submission, more monitoring, more reviews, more data. So it's a compliance officer's dream, isn't it? All these compliance consultants are, are singing the praises of this one. But the key thing is, two, two pieces of information for you that uh, will make you think as a mortgage broker, is there are approximately, this is from the FCA, 37,000 ARs. Now, they're firms or individuals, mostly individuals, 37,000 advisors who are appointed representatives. That's a lot of people. And there are approximately 3,400 principal firms. There'll be a few networks in there, of course, but there's a lot of firms. That's advisors as well as mortgage advisors because uh, many, many networks, of course, have financial advisors as members. But that's an awful lot of people running, running around, and the FCA don't think they're being looked after properly. Anyway, key thing in there is you need to do more monitoring, more supervision, more coaching, all those good things, and we can help with that if you want some help with that side of things. Anyway, let's move away from there. Let's get into the topic of interest rates. And Mr. Bailey, Andrew Bailey, the great communicator, as I call him, came out last week with the Bank of England Policy Committee and they decided to increase interest rates. We know that. And it went up to 1.75%. Oh my God, it's, it's locust infestation, yeah. But I was around when rates were 15, 16%, so let's not worry too much about that. Anyway, they're on the way up. And there's a forecast that by 2033 or 23 next year, they're going to be around about the 3% mark. Now that's Bank of England base rates. So you'll be thinking, well, how's that going to affect everything else? And what I want to do now is show you visually how this all works. So um, let's head over to the whiteboard, shall we? So that we can uh, get some pictures going for you. Let's head over to this camera so you can see my whiteboard quite clearly. Hope you're all good, by the way. Hope all life is, is treating you well. Not too hot in this heat wave that we've got at the moment. But there's a heat wave, of course, with the Bank of England because their biggest problem at the moment is inflation. It's raging away inflation, not just because of fuel prices and food prices from the world and supply chain shocks. It's now getting uh, burnt into the economy, which means that normal prices are going up in the economy. Wages are going up, prices are going up. Companies are putting their prices up left, right and centre. And um, people are feeling the pinch. Of course they are. Now, the Bank of England need to do something about it. They have a target of 2% for inflation, which is way out. They completely missed this one. And uh, they are criticised for it, but actually they did have the pandemic to deal with at the time as well, so they couldn't quite see it. Anyway, what's happened? Bank of England. Let's put the Bank of England up on our, uh, our board here so we can see them quite clearly. Let's put our Bank of England here for you. So let's put uh, the, the, the bank. There you go. The Bank of England looks something like this. You've got... Uh, Sort of pillars of the Bank of England. It's known for its pillars, and we've got um, some more pillars down here. Do you like my picture of the Bank of England? There you go, of the Bank of England, and there, there. It's all looking lo rather lovely. That's the Bank of England. Now, the Bank of England, of course, are the government's bank, and uh, they are the lender of last resort. All those good things. Now, we do need to put the government in here. Now, the bank, the Bank of England, is independent from Her Majesty's government. But we do need to put the government in here as well. So let's uh, let's get some more pictures going, shall we? So let's put the uh, the big Ben there for you. You like that one, do you? And then we can put uh, some some more pictures up here. And we can get that one here as well. And we'll put a little picture there. And we'll have a little top top to the uh, spire of of, uh, of Westminster. I <laughs> hope you like these pictures. They're just a bit of fun, really, aren't they? And at the end of the day, we, have, we can have a little bit of fun if we wish to. So there's uh, there's the the government, the UK government. Now the government, of course control the Bank of England, they do have independence, so they can do what they like to interest rates. It's not a political thing anymore. It used to be a few years ago, not anymore, which is good. 
um, was it Gordon Brown did that one one of the best things Gordon Brown did one of the worst things he sold all our gold but we won't go into that one now the Bank of England of course have increased the Bank of England base rate to 1.75 percent now the point about 1.75 percent I'll put that up here for you is that's the Bank of England base rate now what does that actually mean well that actually means is that if you want to off the banks the commercial banks want to deposit money with the Bank of England then they will get paid 1.75% risk-free. So that there's no risk there, you see, that's risk-free. So commercial banks now need to make some decisions because if they've got money, they can just flow it into the Bank of England and get 1.75% risk-free, which if you compare it to the last 10, 12 years, is a good rate of return. So we now need to put our focus on the banks, on the commercial banks, who we love dearly. So let's put the commercial banks over here, shall we, onto our picture so you can see where they go. So let's let's put our commercial banks in here. Let's put a little sort of circle there as well. And we'll get that so going across there like that. Let's put a little bank here there. Sort of a commercial bank, how, how, how they used to look, I suppose. Not what they look like now because they're all online, aren't they? So let's just put that there, that can go there. And we'll put a great big uh, bank in there. That's, that's a commercial bank. Now, the commercial bank's job is to run the economy, to lend money, to take money, etc. There's all sorts of specialist banks, specialist lenders as well. They all kind of come into it. But the commercial banks, their job, as you can appreciate, is to lend money. Now, they've got money in the bank vaults. So they've got cash. Let's put a little cash in there. They've got money. Now, they get money from depositors, from current account holders, etc. They also get money from the wholesale market. So they've got money which they can lend. Now, if they wanted to now, they could give it to the Bank of England at 1.75%, a decent return. So, you know, if they're, if they're lending out really low rates of interest to mortgage holders, they want to get a better return. So they make a decision. Do they lend or do they shove it with the Bank of England? Now, of course, commercial banks want to lend. And that's how they make their profits. So they're going to lend that money out. So the first uh, people that we need to be aware of, of course, it affects us, are mortgage holders. So they're going to lend that money in the form of mortgages. There you go, there's a mortgage. To two types of people, really. First of all, they're going to lend it to consumers like you and I. So let's put the consumers here, shall we? There we go, there's our little consumer. Da -da -da, da -da -da. There's our consumer. Now, our consumer, of course, is pretty unhappy at the moment because they're having to incur um, a higher return because the bank, of course, will lend to a consumer at a higher rate than 1.75 because they could give it to the Bank of England at 1.75. They obviously need to make a bit of a margin, a bit of a profit as well. So they're going to start lending to that consumer at a higher rate. It's as simple as that. So if you're getting moaned because you know the, these lenders are pulling these fixed rates from you overnight, it's because they can't afford to lend that money anymore at that rate. They have to lend it at a higher rate. So consumers, of course, are going to be rather upset about this. But the thing about most existing borrowers, not new borrowers, I'm talking about existing borrowers, and these figures come from the, the Bank of England, by the way, so they're pretty robust figures. So there's, there's the property. Um, the figures are 85%, there you go, are fixed. So 85% of existing mortgages are fixed, which means they, they ain't gonna go up. Obviously, we know that. So these, these people are pretty happy. I mean, I've got a fixed rate, Shirley and I've got a fixed rate, which has got another two years left on it. And we're fixed at two point something. And uh, we're quite happy with that, as you can imagine we are. So we're unaffected. However, here's the bad news. Again, this is from uh, the Bank of England the Economist, these figures. By 2025, this is the, the, the big issue we've got here, really. Let's put a little uh, emergency sign in here. Can you, this is kind of like an emergency, like that. Da, da, da. By 2025, there you go, which is only, what, a couple of years away, they reckon a large proportion of those fixed rate mortgages are going to come up for renewal. Don't know exactly what the figures are, quite a lot. Because most of the fixed rate mortgages in this country are two, three or five year, aren't they, if you think about it. And when interest rates were really low just before the pandemic, we took ours out in 2019 and we got 2% at the beginning of 2019. We had a five year fix. And most people, of course, are in that 2019, 2025. So most people's fixed rates at low rates are going to come up for renewal. So in a couple of years time, next year, year after, these people are going to come up for renewal of their mortgage rates. And I worked out our figures this morning. And for each 1% increase in our mortgage, we have to pay another 200 quid. 
So that's a lot of money. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to be faced with some more money, as everybody else is. And that, that means that consumers, these borrowers, even though they're fixed now, they're going to start getting a bit, uh, bit cautious now. They're going to think seriously about not spending so much money if they can help it, is the key. So that's, that's mortgage borrowers. Now, who else does, does the banks lend to then on mortgage? Well, they lend to landlords, don't they? So let's put a landlord picture in here as well. Now, landlords is a massive proportion of the market, particularly for some of you who deal in specialised lending. Landlords, property developers, all sorts of issues there. Now, they're rather different. So what, what happened there is the mortgages are being lent to landlords. So the landlord, of course, has she, has she has a different operation. She has a property. Of course she does. There you go. Let's put the property there for her. Da, 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 da. There's your landlord, and that property is to rent. There you go. Make sure we know the difference there. Da, da, da. That property is to rent. Now, the, 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 the problem with landlord-based mortgages or buy-to-let mortgages is not so many of them are fixed. Oddly enough, many of them come to you know, the end. And again, figures show that 70%, 70, are fixed at the moment. Again, they're not fixed for long terms. We don't do that in this country. They do it in the US, we're not here. So many of the landlord's mortgages in a few years' time will come to uh, be renewed and therefore they will have the offer of a higher rate of interest. So what do landlords do when they're having to pay higher rates of interest? Well, simply, they put the rent up. Da, 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 da. They increase the rent. So suddenly, you see, people who rent properties... Um, who don't have mortgages, they just rent, their rents are starting to go up. So already the Bank of England base rate going up to 1.7 is costing people more money. They're having to pay more for their normal mortgage, landlords pay more for their mortgages, therefore they put their rents up, so everybody starts to feel the pinch. And that's what the government want, you see, that's what the, the Bank of England want. They want to change consumer behaviour. They want to stifle people's ability to spend money willy-nilly you know, like restaurants and stuff like that. They want to stop that happening. They want to contract spending. And if you contract spending, then you reduce inflation because supply and demand, isn't it? If you reduce demand, then prices will come down. That's just economic sense. And already we've seen that happening with borrowers. Okay, what else happens then? And it's looking at the wider economy now, not just mortgage lending, which you're probably focused on. We need to take a look at businesses, companies, because banks not only lend on mortgage, they also lend, let's put this over here, shall we? let's sneak this across here, they also lend on loans. Now obviously a lot of loans, there you go, are lent to consumers, I get that, credit cards, personal loans, all those things are lent to consumers, and it's a large proportion, and rates are going up on these things, but Hey, credit card interest rates have been languishing at 25, 30% for years anyway. So, crikey, I don't know what they're going to go up to now. Um, but lo personal loans, of course, are slightly higher. But it's not so much to the consumers where the problem is. The problem is lending to businesses. So let's, let's put a big company in here, shall we? Let's put a big business in. So I'm going to sneak in a, a business here for you. So, uh, OK, let's, let's, get, uh, let's put one here, shall we? Here we go. Let's put a little picture of, of our business here, the big, big company. Here we go, here we go, here we go. So let's put up the business in there and we'll put some windows in there because they've got like a sort of top story building here. And uh, we'll keep that one going down and then we'll have that at the bottom, big sort of, big sort of window there as well. Like my picture of a, of a company, it'll do. It looks like a cake actually, doesn't it? But uh, it's fine. Now that's a company, that's a business. So let's put the uh, company. Now, the, the majority of, of spending in this country is, of course, done by consumers, but businesses also do a lot of spending, and it's, those, it's that spending that creates our economy. That's what creates our gross domestic product, isn't it? It's all the turnover that goes on. And banks, of course, borrow money or lend money to businesses, and businesses use money to start to expand and to you know, create new markets, etc., but you see, they're now starting to have to pay more interest because no longer are they cheap loans. And the cheap loans have caused, um, I think you might have read it in the, in the business called um, zombie companies. So here's, here's my picture of a zombie. Here we go. Let's put, let's put a little zombie in here. Sorry. Let's put some dodgy teeth in there, shall we? 
And there's, a, there's my picture of a zombie. Now they're called zombie companies because in the last 12 years since the financial crash, these, these firms have been kept in business by cheap loans from banks. Because interest rates have been like quarter percent, haven't they? So they've been borrowing cheaply from banks and, and, and commercial banks and just kept alive through cheap borrowing. And they've kept themselves alive. Um, the productivity is just dire. They don't produce an awful lot. They don't do an awful lot, employ a lot of people, of course. But these zombie companies are going to go bust. Wait for that. That'll happen next year. That'll cause big issues. You'll think. The BBC will come on and you say, terrible news, so-and-so's gone bust. And everybody will panic and will go on social media. But the fact is, these zombie companies shouldn't be alive anyway. They've been kept alive artificially by cheap loans. They don't have much productivity. They don't actually contribute much to the economy. If they go bust, yes, there's going to be people made unemployed. But hopefully those people go to companies that are more productive and, and have a better uh, potential to achieve greater profits. So zombie companies themselves will go bust. The second thing with firms, and I'll put my little picture in here, is they will start battening down the atches. You've probably heard that phrase before, so let's put that in there. They will, they will start battening down the atches. So let's put some atches here, yeah. Do, 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 do. So there, there's the window of these companies, there you go. They'll start battening down their hatches, which means they'll stop spending. They'll stop expanding. They'll stop um, producing more goods. They'll contract. They'll cut back budgets in different departments. Uh, if you're working for a large mortgage firm, for example, network principal, they'll start closing departments that are not essential. And marketing gets cut back. Training and development gets cut back. So you know, if you're languishing in hotels and the training development budget, they'll go. You'll start to have to do more online. Your costs will have to come down because they need to contract. And when they contract, of course, it might be unemployment. And then there'll be lots of people looking for work. So they reckon next year unemployment might increase. These things all cause recessions. And that's the whole point here. These businesses batten down the hatches, zombie companies going, this will cause recession because businesses stop expanding, people's jobs start to get lost, etc., etc. And that's not good news. And again, you see, that contracts the economy. And that's what interest rates are doing. You can see the knock-on effect, can't you, how it all works. Um, the last effect for you to think about is that when the Bank of England increased their base rate, which they've done, it also affects the government's ability to borrow money. Now, as you know, the government, UK government there, borrows money, it obviously gets taxes from people, it borrows money to fund its spending. And it's been able to do that over the last 10, 12 years with very low rates of interest. Now, I agree, any guilt issued on the market is fixed for its lifetime, but any new guilt that get issued to replace all the ones that mature will have to be offered at a higher rate of interest. In other words, the government has to start paying more interest uh, each year than they've ever done before. And that's going to cause the government to start cutting back. They're going to cut their spending as well, or they might increase their taxes. Now, Rishi and uh, Liz Truss have been telling everybody they're going to reduce taxes, but they actually can't afford it. <laughs> I wish people would understand that. You've got to keep taxes coming in to pay for spending. And obviously, if the interest rate on our government debt is going up, then you're going to have to pay more for that. So spending cuts will occur. And again, that will contract the economy as well. So you can see why these things cause a recession at some point if you talk it up, which is what Bailey's done. But we'll go on to that in a second. Um, so that's, that's guilt. So obviously the Bank of England owns, I think it's about a third of the government debt now. So at the moment, of course, the government are paying the Bank of England interest on a third of their national debt. The Bank of England's owned by the government, so the government are paying themselves interest, which you can't make that up, can you, really? Not a lot of people appreciate that. And they'll probably just cancel those gilts, or they might just sell them back on the market and make some more money. That might fund the government's spending for a few years. But that's, that's the effect of QE, isn't it, which has been going... Which, by the way, stopped completely now. <laughs> they don't need to do that anymore. In fact, they are actually reversing it, reverse engineering it, and selling the gilts that the, the Bank of England bought with, with printed money onto the marketplace because you can now sell them out at higher rates you see much a much more profitable way of doing things or they can just cancel them which they'll probably do so that's the effect of interest rates really as you can appreciate the conclusion that the bank of england want is to reduce spending so later this year they'll, they'll probably increase it again by another quarter they'll probably do when the government's come back probably in the autumn just before the 
the, uh, the, the energy cap gets released and then announced, which is, sounds terrible. They'll probably put another half percent, that's two and a quarter, and be three percent by next year. Which again, this all affects all these people, consumers, landlords, businesses, everybody gets affected by high interest rates, which stops them having spare money in their pocket, which stops them spending discretionary money which makes them feel worried for the future, everyone batting down the hatches, and the whole economy just grinds to halt. Demand for the economy, GDP starts to contract. A couple of quarters of those, and we're into an official recession. It'll be a mild one. There may be one. There may not be one. We don't know yet. Consumers do still have quite a lot of money in their pockets, which is interesting. A lot of, um, a lot of savings still because they, they've done some, some, some research onto that. The pandemic put a lot of money in people's pockets through various methods. People weren't spending so much, were they? And a lot of people have kept that money in the bank. So although mortgage rates got, they still got a little bit of money to sort of do what they need to do. So you might see that might just be enough to keep things moving along. And some banks will still be lending to businesses who will be able to issue shares as well and still do the business if, if some of them feel they want to increase their market share as opposed to battening down the actions. So it'll be a mild, mild recession. We probably won't even notice it. We will notice it because the BBC will make, make song and dance about it. And I wish Andrew Bailey would stop saying to everybody it's going to be a massive recession lasting for two years because everybody starts to believe it then. And the guy needs to be able to, he needs some lessons in communication, I think, to, to be able to um, enhance some, some more confidence. It's all about confidence. That's what the economy is all about. Anyway, I hope that uh, has been useful for you to understand the effect of interest rates. And there's my graphical picture. <laughs> Not too bad, is it?